Okay, you just need to go ahead. So um, we're going to be doing um, a lot uh, with finite fields over uh, not just FP, but uh, extensions of, of FP. So we need to know a little bit about constructing them and um, various operations on them, how to, how to work with them. So I'm going to briefly discuss the construction. So let F be a degree N polynomial over FP. We want it to be irreducible, so that means we want it not to factor into a product of lower degree polynomials. Okay, and um, I'm going to say uh, alpha is a root of f. The formal construction, of course, of this is Kronecker's theorem, uh, by which I mean you take um, a polynomial ring over fp, you take the quotient by the ideal generated by f, and this um, equivalence class in your quotient is basically alpha. And so that gives you something to, to work with. But it's a pain to write out x plus f, the, the ideal gender by f all the time. So it's easier to just use alpha. And... Um, you know, it's a, it's a field, so of course we're allowed to take quotients, but you have inverses, so you can easily get things in the form A0 plus A1 alpha up to AN minus 1 alpha to the N minus 1, A sub I in FP, where the powers in alpha are a basis over FP as a vector space. Um, and you can see this because if you had them being linearly dependent, then you would have a polynomial of lower degree satisfied by alpha. And so then F itself would not be irreducible because that polynomial would be a factor of F. So that gives you um, the fact that it's a basis and so that already tells you the structure of the additive group of this field. You know that it is basically uh, a bunch of, you know, it's, it's, it's a vector space. It's just like, uh, so, so the additive, um, so the additive structure is isomorphic to, um, and copies of Z mod PZ, of course. And just from the vector space structure. Um, and uh, it takes a little bit more work to show that the multiplicative group is cyclic. Uh, I'm not going to go through that. You can look at my notes for that, but it's true. Um, and uh, I'm going to do a uh, quick example, easy example, the, uh, the example everyone should know. All right, so if I want to co construct the field with four elements, I am working over F2, and I need uh, a quadratic irreducible polynomial. There is only one 
for any quadratic polynomial to be reducible over some field, you are basically looking about whether or not it has a root in that field, because if it factors, both factors are going to be linear. And so, and the same goes for a cubic. You know, if you, you can show that a cubic is irreducible uh, if and only if um, it doesn't have um, a root in your ground field because it would have at least a linear factor and a quadratic factor. Maybe it would split into three linear factors, but you're at least guaranteed one linear factor if it's going to factor at all. Above that, then you're, you're having to play more games to, to show irreducibility. Um, in the case of, of F2, to show that something's um, that isn't, uh, doesn't have zero or one, you're just plugging in. And you, you can do the plug in for any FP, but to check in zero and one is easy uh, in, in any field. You put, to see if zero is a root, you're looking only at the constant term. To, to see whether one is a root, you're looking at the sum of the terms. The sum of the terms has to be zero in whatever the field is. So over FP, we're saying simply that uh, the sum of the coefficients is even for it to be uh, have one as a root. So you simply need a polynomial that's quadratic, has one as the constant term, and an odd number of non-zero terms total. Well, there is only one of those, and that is this. And so that gives you your irreducible poly polynomial over F2. And uh, so if you want to do your computations with this, um, you get this equation, which implies this equation because we're over F2 and minus signs don't matter. And so if you want to do, say, alpha plus 1 times alpha, you get alpha squared plus alpha equals alpha plus 1 plus alpha equals 1. So they are inverses of each other. And in fact, uh, this is the other root of this polynomial. It really has to be because there's, it doesn't have, this polynomial doesn't have uh, roots in F2. It ha it's separable. It has, it has distinct roots. And there's only two other roots available to it. So, But you can also do the computations to show that it's uh, the alpha is, is, is a root. So I, I don't want to spend any more time on, on that detail. I hope it's, hopefully it's, it's clear, but I now want to discuss Frobenius. Are there any questions on that before I discuss Frobenius? So, <clears throat> so now um, I'm going to denote Frobenius by sigma from... Uh, fp to the n to fp to the n. And um, it's defined by um, sending x to xp. Um, and the significance of this, so, so this is a homomorphism. Um, and that's not something you would expect if you were working in characteristic zero, because of course, you know, it's generally not true that A plus B to the P is equal to A to the P plus B to the P, usually. Right? But uh, we have... Um, we're in characteristic P, and if you were to actually apply the binomial expansion theorem to this, then all of the um, coefficients in between have P as a factor, which you can easily check by counting factors of factorials. And so um, they vanish, mod P. And so that means this is basically a well-defined homomorphism. It's, it's actually an automorphism of the field, it generates the Galois group. Galois group is, is cyclic, so forth. All of that's discussed in my typed notes. Um, 
So, but in particular, uh, powers of this um, are also automorphisms. <laughs> Um, and um, if you look at the case where k is equal to n, equal to the degree of the field, it's going to act trivially on, on it. And that's a very important point from uh, the theory of, of elliptic curves. Um, we use it multiple times. Um, special case, n equals 1, you're bas you basically have Fermat's little theorem. Uh, so um, that is, um, that, that's, that's the point here, because if you have, um, so i.e. x to pn minus x equals 0 for all x in FPGM. Right. So you see in the case where n is 1, that's basically Fermat's little theorem. So, um, so now we want to consider what happens when we apply this uh, to curves, to points on curves, to, and, and how things work there. So um, the important thing to remember about automorphisms is that in the first place, being an automorphism means that uh, it commutes with both addition and multiplication, right? It has to be a homomorphism of, of the field in, in the first place. And uh, over the field of definition, um, where it acts trivially, um, then it also, it, it, it's, it's important to understand that since, it, it, like, if, if you're looking at sigma n, it's acting trivially on, on FPDN. If you have a polynomial with coefficients FPDN, it's going to act trivially on the coefficients. So if you have a curve, so if, if C is a plane curve, you can do this for more than just plane curves, but I mean, all of my examples are plane curves, so... I'm just doing it for plane curves because I want to get away with writing down one equation. All right, so if, if we have it given by this, where um, F is a polynomial whose coefficients are an F P to the N, uh, then sigma the N is going to act trivially on those coefficients. And so if I take f sigma to n x, sigma to n y, I can pull out sigma to n because it is, we're well, sort of thinking of it backwards. So, so, so think about it going this way. So if I apply sigma to n to this polynomial, it acts... It's, it first can be distributed to each term individually. It can be distributed to each product individually. It then acts trivially on the coefficients and then can be uh, brought inside the powers by the fact that it works on, on the products. And so we get this, right? So it's, I'm writing backwards, but I'm writing this way because now if I have a point on the curve, then this is zero, right? So if sigma n applied to zero, 
and of course it's going to send zero to zero. So the upshot is that um, sigma n um, sends a point on the curve to another point on the curve. So therefore, if p equals x, y is a point on c, then so is sigma to the n dot p equals sigma to the n applied to x and y. I'm running out of room there. All right, you get the point. So that is very important for what we will do. Uh, in particular, in the case of elliptic curves, um, it means that um, we actually have something that is well-defined on what we call torsion. So we're going to discuss torsion now. Okay, so um, let O be the identity on the curve E. If P on E is a point, such that NP, meaning repeated addition of P by itself n times, is equal to the identity, then P is uh, called an N torsion point. Or it's said to be in the end torsion. Uh, there's many different, several different ways we, we say this, okay? And you've seen a special case of this already. Uh, we did this in the case where n is equal to, well, we, we didn't discuss torsion, but we, we saw doubling, right? And, and so we were dealing with the case of repeated addition by, by two already, um, okay? So, so, but it's important to understand that this does not mean that the point has order n, of course, um, because n may not be the least. Uh, so the least such n is set, is called the order P, I mean, that's just the usual definition, is the order P. Um, so um, the n torsion points are the points of order dividing n. Um, that's important. Uh, but also, uh, we know that no matter how many times we add the identity to itself, we always get the identity back. So it, the identity is always an n torsion point, and so we call it the trivial n torsion point, since n o equals o for all n, we call o the trivial and towards the point. So we have to be a little bit careful often um, when speaking of torsion points by saying that we have a non-trivial torsion point. If we don't have such a point, then we often say that we have trivial torsion, right? And, you know, if we are over an algebraically closed field, we're going to have torsion other than trivial torsion. So this is only the question of whether we have tri trivial torsion is something only comes up over small fields where we might not get um, everything, uh, like over Q or over F FP, not algebraically closed fields. 
So, um, so that's, that's important. Um, so let's look at some special cases. Representation for n equals two and three. So, um, for arbitrary n, of course, it would be tough to come up with uh, a geometric interpretation. But there's a very nice geometric interpretation of torsion for n equals two and three. Two torsion is corresponding to um, basically points that have vertical tangent lines. Okay, they are uh, if you have something in, in Weierstrass form anyway, um, and uh, well. Right. So, I mean, you know, class, especially class, y squared equals a, a cubic. You vertical tangent line, um, and you get, um, so, so you get that the y coordinate is, is zero, so you're basically looking at the root, your x coordinates are the roots of the cubic polynomial f. Um, so that's in the case of, of two, so for, for, uh, y squared equals x cubed plus a x squared plus b x plus c. The two torsion points um, have vertical tangents. And then for three, um, you have basically an inflection point, a, a, a line uh, intersecting triply with the curve. And that can be stated generally without this, this polynomial here. Um, so, I mean, technically, if you have the, something with general A's, yeah, you've got, you can still get it from, in a similar way, I'm not sure vertical is really the best way to say it, but it's it's very easy, a very nice interpretation with the two torsion. Um, so for three torsion, uh, inflection points. And so I already discussed uh, in the last lecture that um, the point at infinity um, is a, a triple point on the curve that the line at infinity intersects it triply there. It's an inflection point. And so that, sh that it should make sense then. I mean, it, it always, it definitely makes sense from this perspective that, um, from, from the perspective of repeated addition of the identity that you're always going to get the identity, so it has to be a three torsion point. But it meshes well with this interpretation for, for three torsion. That it's a, a three, um, that it's an inflection point, um, and in the exercises, um, I I have a problem where I ask you to to compute what's called the division polynomial. Division polynomials give you the x coordinates of torsion points, um, and I ask you to compute it using um, partial differenti uh, implicit differentiation. So if you do implicit differentiation twice, you can figure out what the inflection points are, and that tells you then what your, your three torsion points are. Um, for general division polynomials, they get pretty hard. I have the general formulas uh, in the notes. Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't think I have time to show them to you, uh, but you can look in the notes. Um, one look at them will convince you it's better to walk to a computer. <laughs> at least, at least if it's bigger than four. All right, you know, up to four, you know, sure, you can do it by hand maybe, but I would not touch them for for uh, five torsion or or higher by hand. Um, so uh, that is. Uh, so, but three torsion is totally reasonable to do by hand. I recommend it if you want to try that exercise, computing it with, with um, implicit differentiation. 
Okay, so we want to see what happens when we apply for, for binyas to the torsion. And um, so if we have, so action of Frobenius on torsion. Let E be an elliptic curve over F P W K. Then uh, sigma to the K um, well. Not only is our curve defined by polynomials over this field, so are the addition formulas, right? Because we're getting addition formulas basically by this algebraic computation, which happens completely over this field. And so this commutes with the addition. This is addition on the elliptic curve. So, I mean, there's, there's something a little bit non-trivial going on here because um, while it's... It's, it's, it's basically from the definition of automorphisms that this commutes with ordinary addition. The fact that it commutes with this addition is coming from the definition of addition law on the curve. So, but it, it's, it's true. It commutes with it. Okay. Uh, and so now... If P and Q are specifically n torsion points, well, I mean, so so we can we can repeat this, right? We can repeat this with by induction. So P sigma to the K. I think it's probably already clear where I'm going with this, but I'm gonna write it down. All right, if we can if we get it commuting with a, a, a addition. We get a meeting with repeated addition, and so uh, if N P is a torsion point, an N torsion point, then sigma K is going to act trivially on the identity. Why is it act trivial on the identity? Well, remember, for the identity, we had we had this. That's defined over the base field FP. Uh, so it's going to act trivially on that. And um, so basically, um, what we get is N sigma K dot P equals sigma K and P equals sigma K O equals O. So sigma k is well defined on n torsion, and um, if you look specifically at prime values of n different from p, so we often call those primes L to distinguish them from from p. Uh, we have a vector space in terms of repeated addition of the points with a different structure, not over F p over F L. So we'll be dealing with that. Probably not so much today, but tomorrow it's going to come up quite a bit. Um, and um, we'll be able to get matrices. Uh, yes? So, yesterday we have been talking about algebraically closed fields, elliptic curves over algebraically closed fields. Yeah. Um, how is uh, the algebraically closed field different from the algebraically closed as in this case? Well, how's how's it? So the question was, how is this affected by not being algebraically closed? Uh, like if you if you're starting with a point that is uh, in F P to the K or some extension, but not over the algebraic closure, um, how how does that affect this? Well, it affects what you have as two torsion points available to you. Okay. But um, if you have a two tor if you have a certain torsion point available, 
then the action of Frobenius on is, is, is exactly like this. All right. It could be that you only have trivial torsion. And so then the action of Frobenius is quite boring. It's just, you know, acting on O, sending to O. That's it. <coughs> but uh, so when we discuss the vector space structure tomorrow, uh, we are going, the, the chore is to extend to a field that has full torsion. And so that's the real trick, is figuring out where, where the full torsion is. And so the division polynomials are useful for that, figuring out how to find the torsion. Um, but um, again, not something I would want to do by, by hand. Um, so I, when we do it tomorrow, I will be writing down the SAGE code that can do that for you. So... Um, I hope that answered the question. Um, so now um, let's look at a simple example. And this is an example um, I like a lot for many things, except it is not well suited to what I want to do tomorrow. Um, okay, so this is an elliptic curve. Um, that is not defined over F2, but it is uh, defined um, over Fp when P is odd. Uh, and there's a condition that tells us whether or not we have full two torsion or not, just based on congruences. So x squared plus 1 factors over Fp if um, minus one is a quadratic residue. And so therefore, if P is congruent to one mod four. Um, and uh, so, and it does not, Uh, if, if it's non residue. Okay. And if it's in the, in the case of P equals zero, uh, then it, this is not even an elliptic curve. Uh, it's singular. So, um, so for an interesting example here, what we want is a prime congruent to 3 mod 4, because if I pick something where I have full torsion over FP, well, Frobenius is going to be acting trivially on it. It's not going to show you anything. It's just going to send each of the two torsion points to themselves. We want something a little bit more interesting than that. So I'm going to take P equals 3. Um, so then... Um, x squared plus 1 does not factor. It's irreducible over F3. So you can use it to construct an extension that has it as, that has a root, right? So um, let Alpha squared plus one equals zero. That gives a very nice simple x coordinate to use for our two torsion point. So, and we know that the y coordinate is zero. So that means that we have, so our two torsion is uh, zero, zero, alpha zero. Minus alpha zero and the identity. And so we want to look at the action of Frobenius. Well, Frobenius acts trivially on 
that one, clearly. If you cube 0, you get 0. Phi of alpha 0 equals alpha cubed 0. Uh, equals alpha squared times alpha. Equals minus alpha. So what phi does is it exchanges these two. It exchanges the, these two torsion points and fixes this one. Now if we wanted to get a matrix we would have to set up a basis for the two torsion. Uh, we won't do that with this example. We'll do it with uh, ones I'm using in, on, on Wednesday. Uh, but um, for two torsion, uh, basically any pair of these, these uh, points could be picked as a basis. And uh, so you you get different matrices. The matrix that you get is not going to be unique, of course. Um, uh, and I should also say that when you look at the action of Frobenius, well, I'll say, I'll save that discussion for, for, for Wednesday, but I mean, it, it's only giving you the act, the matrix you get from this construction is only giving you the action on the L torsion, whatever L is. In this case, L is equal to two. So this is um, action of phi on L torsion for L equals 2. And um, that's important. It does not give you the full action for Vinyas, but it gives you the piece of the picture. Uh, okay, so... Um, we now need to uh, discuss the concept of an endomorphism. Um, all of these things we've been discussing so far are examples of endomorphisms. Um, phi is called an endomorphism. Oh, uh, let me let me use psi. Psi is called an endomorphism. Of e, um, if it is a homomorphism um, I mean there's there's better definitions that don't require as I mean, this is a bit heavy-handed. You can use weaker definitions to define it, but I'm trying to avoid going over a whole lot of <laughs> algebraic geometry here. Um, so, so the deal is, is that, um, of course, it does not have to be um, surjective. It doesn't have to be an automorphism. You can send everything to zero, for instance, I say zero. I mean the the identity, of course. So so I would call the, the endomorphism we would denote by zero. So zero dot p equals o for all p. Okay, that's um, that's that's one option. Uh, we have um, n dot p for N and Z uh, for positive integers. If we take N equals one, we're just saying we have the identity. Uh, we're sending everything to itself. If for um, N two or greater, we're looking at multiples. 
doubling, tripling, so forth. Um, and of course, we have negation, sending a point to its inverse. And so between these two together, we can also get all negative n, right? By composing those. By composing B and C, we get all um, in C. All right, all negative F. Um, so basically, we have one endomorphism for every integer. And that's true uh, regardless of what field we're working with. Uh, but over finite fields, we also have the Frobenius endomorphism. So over finite fields, um, F P to the N, um, phi sending um, Okay, and um, there are cases even when you're not working in over finite field where you may get other endomorphisms. Um, so um, I don't really have an example of that in these notes because these are this we're supposed to be talking mainly about finite fields, but I do have the general description of uh, what I, I do have the general theorem which we will. We will do, um, but you know th this is so. So, and there are also other options for finite fields. Sometimes uh, that's a very important point. Uh, so let me do the, the general theorem. Um, but but basically, I hope you're getting the idea of, of what what's what's going on here. You can consider maps from the elliptic curve to itself. Um, and uh, these maps often provide many uh, provide useful information about the, the curve, and they're also useful trips and, tricks in cryptography in terms of speed ups with, say, the Frobenius endomorphism. So, theorem. I'm not going to prove this at all. Um, this theorem is discussed in Silverman's book on elliptic curves, so you can read it there. Um, if E is an elliptic curve, then endomorphisms of E form a ring, isomorphic to one of the following. Z, hopefully there's no surprise there. We have the uh, all the integers available to us is endomorphism, so that's an option. We could have only those, and that does happen with uh, elliptic curves over the rational. Say, so, um, so uh, then second option in order in an imaginary. quadratic number field.
Um, I'm not sure if you know what the general concept of an order is. Uh, it's not that important to us for our purposes um, here. It's a, a subring of, of some kind. Certainly as examples of orders, you have the uh, integers in the number field, but that's not the only option. Orders are sort of to be a little bit more general than the integers themselves. Um, and three, an order in a quaternion algebra. Uh, and this, um, so we'll discuss what each of these mean for, for uh, curves over finite fields shortly, but let's continue with their names. So in case one, E is often said to have trivial endomorphism rank. Right? Case one is said to have trivial anamorphism. Um, case two, uh, E is said to have complex multiplication. Oh. Uh, in case three, E is said, or the CM is used as an abbreviation often. Uh, e, e is said to be super singular or super special. Um, super singular is the historical definition. Um, and, you know, I, I understand that, but it, it can be mis, misleading. Um, and so in, in my notes anyway, I try and stick with super special. Um, I hope for clarity. But um, if you encounter uh, most uh, sources are going to use uh, the phrase super singular. The point is it's not... Uh, it doesn't have anything particular to do with what we consider as a singularity these days. Um, and so that's why it's, it's somewhat confusing. Um, it looks like I'm nearly out of time. Uh, I'm going to... Uh, so, so let me first quick, quickly say what the relevance is to, to curves over finite fields and number fields. So over number fields... The, the third one can't occur at all. Um, over finite fields, obviously, we have a Frobenius anamorphism, always, right? And so the first one can't occur. So, but the third one can, and that is crucial for uh, elliptic curve cryptography because the super singular curves are, or super special curves are terribly unsafe. Um, and so they need to be avoided. So we need absolutely a criteria to help us find them. And rather than having to write it all from scratch, I'm just going to put this up there. This, so is that in focus? It doesn't look like it's in focus. Um, that's, I don't know where the focus is. Look, look, at, look at my, uh, my notes, my, my PDF notes. So, so, there's this, um, so there's this theorem uh, due mostly to Durin. Um, that gives a couple different criteria for testing whether something is super singular. And then I go through this little argument that's sort of sketchy uh, and explain how in certain cases that are useful to us, it is equivalent to having trace zero. Tra well, trace AP is going to be, as we will learn, the trace of the Frobenius endomorphism. And so if you can compute that, which is computable 
in polynomial time using the algorithm I will show you tomorrow, um, then you can easily determine whether or not it is super singular or uh, super special or, or not. And so um, that is um, one strategy. And there are other problems related to that on, on the, in the exercise. Questions about any of what we did? We're basically out of time for today.